The doctor will see you now. Hello, plague doctor. Well, that's a bit terrifying, but also strangely comforting. Thank you for seeing me. Absolutely, Sam. Actually, can you just hold on one second? I feel as though this might be a little bit easier, if that's okay with you. Okay, yes, that's, that's much better. So before this outbreak, you were studying the history of plagues and anthropology of infectious disease. But as we just saw, you did it with a twist. Can you tell us a little bit more about your unique approach and what you're hoping to accomplish by doing things this way? Well, anthropology and theater are the two loves of my life. So integrating costumes into my classes felt like a really natural step. So to frame the anthropological study of infectious diseases through time, I tried to feature several characters, including the plague doctor who you've just met, to illustrate an individual experience with disease. So in that case, bubonic plague in the 17th century. So by integrating individual voices with the biological and the epidemiological data sets, I was really hoping to make history come alive and to help students viscerally integrate the lessons of past pandemics into their own lives because statistics are so important but they can also feel quite impersonal and I really wanted my students to have an understanding of infectious diseases from the macro or societal level but also from that individual and embodied level. And I gotta ask, I know you already had the costume but how did you come up with this idea of making the plague doctor this like leathery bird and with a huge feel. Like, how did you come up with that? It's just so wild. There's a French physician, Charles de Lomme. He is actually credited with inventing this first getup back in 1619. Now, what we're actually seeing, and what's really exciting about this, is this really is just an early version of personal protective equipment that healthcare workers are wearing today. So a plague doctor who was hired by a town experiencing an outbreak of plague would wear a protective suit, including a waxed fabric overcoat, and then the mask, like this one, this, this bird-like mask with these eye-opening all covered up and this beak shaped nose. Now some of the earliest versions of this were actually made entirely of leather so if you can just imagine this kind of scary looking leather overcoat with this again with this big long nose and that nose was stuffed with herbs and straw and spices. Now when we think about putting wax on our clothes and shoving spices into the beak it actually makes perfect sense at the time because in the 17th century there's this idea of miasma or the idea that a bad air that disease was originating and spreading in foul smelling air or like the nasty vapors released by decaying matter. So the coat surface was waxed so as not to allow that bad air to stick to it. Whereas the beak is filled with fresh smelling herbs, which is meant to keep the plague doctor safe because they would be breathing in good smells rather than the bad smells that was it was believed was actually spreading disease. Now the doctor also carried a cane which was used to examine and direct the patients without having to touch them directly and maybe also protect the doctor, perhaps from a, uh, from a desperate patient. Why do you think that studying the past is so important? How can knowing more about past knowledge and how things were handled previously, how can that help us in the present pandemic? I know there's that the phrase of, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Well, understanding the past is so critical because it gives us the chance to learn. Now, COVID-19 itself as a disease is new, but looking back can remind us that human societies have faced massive crises before and survived. Now, the word plague itself comes from a Greek word meaning wound and injury, but also meaning misfortune. So this means that plagues are much more than just biological events. They have incredibly important social qualities. So thinking about COVID-19 means thinking about an individual virus, of course, and its infectious properties and its vectors, but also about thinking about how it affects our ideas of vulnerability, how it affects our abilities to move freely and how it affects our ability to care for others. Because COVID-19, like other epidemics and pandemics before it, reveals societal fault lines and the structural inequalities we're living with all the time. Now today we have excellent global communication networks, we have the ability to learn and share information faster than ever before. So if we listen and we learn from these lessons of the past, we can reject stigma and blame and focus instead on working together. Because what's really critical right now is cumulative small scale actions. Staying home as much as possible, washing your hands thoroughly, and staying socially connected while we're still remaining physically distant. So I gotta ask, I have the plague doctor with me. I gotta yep. ask, what parting advice do you have for us? I know you can't give medical advice over the internet, yeah. but what parting advice would be important for us to know about? Definitely. That's the thing. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a doctor in anthropology. And I think anthropology gives us a chance to, well, Ruth Benedict said, to make the world safe for human differences. That should be the goal of anthropology. And it's certainly something I've worked towards. But I think on an individual basis, on a day-to-day basis right now, just be kind to yourself. Self-care is super important. It's this really, really stressful time. And if you feel like you're only operating at about 60, 65%, that's absolutely okay. Allow yourself the time to be 
in the moment and allow yourself the time to laugh. It's okay to feel happy and to feel sad or to feel scared. Just feeling your feelings and allowing yourself to be who you are would be the best advice I could give just human to human. And as somebody who works with anthropological and historical data sets, I'd say, please keep a diary. Please journal some of your thoughts and feelings and what's going on because future anthropologists and future historians are going to be looking back at those individual uh, documents and using that to understand what people went through. It's something I do from folks that lived 250 or 500 years ago. So please be one of those future anthropologist dreams. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful chatting and learning from you and all the best with your research. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me on.